Welcome to this episode of the I Hate Matt Ball Poetry Podcast, where today we're going to be going through a few different questions about things. We're going to talk about some line breaks and some shit about that. I got a question about um, how my rarity talk rubbed some people the wrong way. So we'll be talking about that. But first... Your mom has a question for you. Have you helped your mom today? Have you done everything you can today to help your mom be the greatest that your mom can be? If you haven't, links will be in the description below or in this thing. So you can go over and find out how to make your mom proud. How to bring a smile to the lips of your mom. Okay? Also, it would be great if you can give this show five stars on iTunes. And I'm gonna assume that over the next week, I will not have gotten this up on Spotify and all that other shit yet, because that is still in the works. To be honest with you, I talk a little bit about this in my upcoming poet vlog, but I may have broken my ankle on top of my knee um, having a torn ACL. So I'm kind of in sad shape right now <laughs> and i just uber eats taco bell so i'm waiting for that so you're gonna keep me company while we wait for whoever is going to be bringing me taco bell that is way too expensive to be taco bell okay let's just call it what it is but i'm also going to need to order a bunch of alcohol tonight because the pain i am in is excruciating and i'm trying really hard to focus and be fun and be peppy and also be informative for all of you but i am in excruciating pain right now and um yeah and it just keeps getting worse um, i don't know if you are familiar with what could be a sprain versus a break but if I touch the bone, I'm in a lot of pain. My foot is swollen, and it is all sorts of different colors. Mainly purple and red. But, um, yeah. So, I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it to my appointment on the 13th. I might have to actually go to an emergency room and get this looked at. Because it fucking is killing me but enough about me bitching about stuff and let's get to those motherfucking shout outs am i right all right so i want to give a big thank you to all these awesome motherfuckers over on patreon i want to give a big thank you to chase to michael to deborah to cedar to harry thank you guys so much I want to give a big thank you to the thank you crew over on the tubes. I want to give a big thank you to Patrick, to Britt, to JH, and to Jan. You guys are awesome. I want to give a big thank you to all you sexy mofos over in the Anarchy Crew. To Bunny, to Nate, to Mandy, to Hannah, to Thomas, to Tim, J, to Lisa, to Josh, to Shaylin, to Caitlin, to Jessica, to Tim G, and to Chill Baby. Thank you guys so much and i also want to give a big thank you to tamara or tamara i still don't know the correct pronunciation of your name so thank you guys you guys are the thing that keeps the world going round if you know what i'm saying hello again and you might be think to you might be thinking to yourself wow your hair looks a lot different you look a lot older and it's very bright in there Yes, all of these things are true. It has been a couple days since I started the beginning of this podcast. Now, um, some time has gone by. A lot of things have changed. Your mom is up and running, um, and she needs you to get behind her. My ankle is killing me, but I'm supposed to go to the doctor today at Trace O'Clock for x-rays. I just washed my hair, so it's all natural and all over the place it stopped raining finally like it rained here for days and snowed like crazy in a lot of places it was snowing in fucking burbank yesterday for fuck's sake uh but yeah so there's so much stuff to get get into and talk about oh and the taco bell 
was fine. They didn't screw my order up completely, but the add-ons they didn't get. Like, I spent way too much money on it for the amount of food that I got and immediately was like, oh, I should have ordered something else. Like, not something else from a different place. I just should have got different stuff from Taco Bell. Fucking hell, dude. Okay, so I have two questions that we're going to be going over on this um, podcast here. Okay, so here's the question. The email is titled Unintentional Formatting. I usually start out with pen and paper when I sit down to write a poem. And sometimes as I'm writing it, my hand will go to different points along the following line to begin the next phrase. I don't choose these spots deliberately, and it's really fun to feel when it happens. Like something other than your conscious mind is telling your hand where to go. But I can't focus on it too much, or I'll lose focus on the poem. Does this happen to you? And if so, do you keep them that way when edit? I have toyed with the idea of just leaving all the spacing like that, even though I may not have a conscious reason for it. So I have some examples here, and if you're watching the video of this, you'll be able to see the examples. And if you're just listening to it, I will try to describe it in the best way possible. Funny thing about this is Ferlinghetti, okay? If you're familiar with Lawrence Ferlinghetti, this is um, pictures of the gone world. And I don't know if he did this with a lot of his other stuff too, but this whole book is like this for the most part, where the poems sit on the page like that. Okay? And for those of you who aren't being able to see this, they're all over the place. Okay? You know, like... They're wherever the fuck they feel like being. And then this book from Kenneth Patchen. There's this poem in here. Where, like, the title is, like, longer than the actual poem. But the poem is kind of all over the place. And with this one, I kind of liked it. Because it was just like, oh, I see what he did there. It's kind of a... Thing. Like, if I were to read this poem to you, it wouldn't make really any impact. But when you see it, the impact becomes a thing. Here is... I don't think he does anything really like that. He's more of a, a left-justified dude. Although... So, like, Frank O'Hara here. Like, they're all left-justified, and then there's this. All over the place. Okay? Ginsburg, he does something that I first really saw with um, Edgar Allan Poe actually where he would take like the first line and then indent the next one until the thought was over if that makes any sense if you want to take more looks at that you know what I'm saying and it could be anything really you know and then he has more like standard kind of things like that so basically, what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is that you could do whatever the fuck you want, you know. There is this theory that I have, and a lot of other people have this too. So, like, I'm not saying I'm coining this. I feel like your poem needs to do the same thing on the page as it would when you read it. Okay, so if your poem on the page looks a certain way that when you read it, you reading it cannot convey the look of it, it probably doesn't need it to look like that. Okay, if that makes sense. If your poem, when you read it, is really big and boisterous and like you do all this shit with it when you're reading it, but when you read it on the page, it doesn't do that then all that production you put into the performance kind of doesn't matter. Do you see what I'm saying? Does this make any sense to you? When you're writing, if you are feeling indents a certain way and tabs a certain way, and, like, again, like, if when you're typing it out and you're doing, like, tab to, like, move across the page, if it's not working for you, just hold the space bar down. 
or start coming up with like, okay, I could hit the space bar five times. I could hit the space bar 10 times. I could hit the space bar 17 times. Those are my things that I'm going to do, you know? And again, with the way a lot of like free floating formatting goes, whenever you put that in something, it's not going to look like that unless you lock that down. And some people I've heard talk about, like, it's hard for them when they're putting a poem of somebody's up on their website or something like that because they do shit like that. And what I say to do, and again, this isn't going to be great for SEO or anything like that, but just put a JPEG of the poem up on the site if the poet is going to bitch about exactly how it looks on the page or on the screen. Because whenever you look at that on any screen, it's going to change where the words go. So just put a picture of it up. Like, screenshot it and put it up. And then that way, at least the format will stay. And if you want to underneath it, or put it in, like, a hidden metadata SEO kind of shit, just type the whole all the words to the poem out somewhere on it, and then have it be, like, something where you have the words underneath in the same color as the background you know so at least google would be able to recognize it even though like no one reading it will be able to see it these are just little tricks guys these are just little tricks some of you just popped and were like oh my god like my life is so much easier now and others are like what the fuck are you talking about dude back to this whole enjambment thing And where lines go and why lines do what. I would say, if you are interested in this stuff, I would say look into concrete poetry, too. Because concrete poetry, if you don't know what that is, it's where the words on the page create an image. Like, and you write the words down on a page in a way that would show you something so like there's this one and i can't remember it but it's about gun violence and the poem is written in the shape of a revolver okay if you see what i'm saying so if you just looked at it it would just look like a picture of a gun but then you like get close and you could like read the words kind of thing so that's kind of interesting and then there's some other concrete poems that are garbage like there's the one we've talked about before on here where it was called something like, like, I took my dog on a plane or something, and the poem was, like, the layout of what the plane seating chart looked like. And I can't remember what it said, but it was, like, person, 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 person. And it said person, like, 250 times, but somewhere in that 250 was one that said dog or something like that. And, like that won a bunch of awards or something so you know whatever am i right look into that and see i know it's not exactly what you were asking but if you are unfamiliar with it just google concrete poetry and see what comes up and see if any of that inspires you one of the things that drives me a little more crazy than most is um, this argument that free verse poetry the line breaks are made up and that the line breaks are arbitrary. And that bothers me. There, there's two things in how I do line breaks, okay? And I've done, like, Poetic Anarchy, Anarchy Crew videos on this and shit. But, but it's two things. One, my lines are my breath. And this is like a Ginsburg thing. Like, make your lines as long as your breath, as long as it would take for you to say those. That's your line, Okay. Now, the problem with that is Ginsburg can talk for fucking days on end. So you look at his books and it's like, and you're like, fucking hell, dude, take a goddamn breath, right? And me, I talk in a certain cadence that's very slow. So a lot of my lines only have like two to three words, maybe four, sometimes five. You guys see what I'm saying? Like, this is how I talk. And this makes it real. This makes it me. This makes it feel like when you read my poetry that I'm sitting there with you talking to you. And a lot of you will know this because a lot of people who read my stuff tell me that they feel like they've known me forever. And they feel like we're old friends. 
and I'm just shooting the shit with them in my poetry. You know what I'm saying? So that's first. That's the first thing. Write your lines how you talk. That's that's me. Okay. The next thing would be to always try to make your lines mean something, whether or not it's attached to the line below it. Okay? Make the line matter. Okay? And I don't do this all the time. I try to do it, or like I hope that I do it, but a lot of the times I will hopefully be knocking this out. Okay, maybe I'll just read this poem to you. So this this is in um, Winner Your Mom Saw Me Prize for Poetry here. And this is called A Metaphor of My Life. I sit at a large table. And when I pause like this, know that that's a line break, okay? I sit at a large table that I sit at every night. I make cigarettes here. I eat food here. I drink wine here. I watch YouTube here. I listen to podcasts here. I look out the window at insanity here. This table that is so large is so full of crap that I only have but a small area to do anything at. The table itself is filled with paints, cups of water, old racing forms, notebooks, cords and wires, wine glasses from nights way gone, empty bottles, full ashtrays, giant bags of tobacco, boxes of tubes, boxes that once held tubes, my cigarette roller, a couple smokes worth of shake, and so many other things too. That only gives me a few inches to work with every day. I sigh at the clogging of my table. I am drunk. I am a bottle of cheap red. I want to go to bed. I get up, almost fall down because of the pain. My left foot has some planter illness. My right knee, some patella malady. I hobble into the shitter, watch a black spot run across the wall. Spider, cockroach, fly, mosquito, I don't know. I can't see properly, even with my glasses, especially when I'm like this, intoxicated. I smash the bug with my fist, then hold my fist close to my eyes, trying to make out the gooey smash on my knuckles. I can't, so I wipe it off with teepee and toss it in my dark yellow piss. That scares me, because I know it should be clearer, which means I should drink more water instead of just coffee and red wine. I stumble back to my bed, stop by my desk, which has a little more room than the large table, type this out, and hope I can make it to bed without falling on my face. Okay, so that was a lot. Um, and I realized that as I was reading it, I'm like, wow, this is kind of, like I should have picked a shorter poem. But like little things, like I smash the bug, okay? That is a line on its own. Like you could put a period at the end of that. I smashed a bug. But then the next line is with my fist. And you're like, oh, so there's more there. Okay. Then hold my fist close. Like hold it close, like I'm caressing it to my eyes. You know, and this might be like getting a little too deep into the weeds here. But the the idea is is that you want each line to be important. Lines shouldn't be throwaway. Like, every line should matter. You know what I'm saying? And if you are going down a poem and you realize that some of the lines in it don't matter, don't push the poem along, get rid of them. Just delete them. Like, knock them out, you know? And that's the thing. Like, a lot of people are like, oh, but you don't like revision. I, I don't like revision because I feel like what I write the first time is worth a damn and it's good. But I'm all about cutting the fat. That's not revision. That's getting rid of waste. I could do that all fucking day. But I'm not going to sit there and go, I said smash the bug. Should I say mash the bug? Swat the bug? Smush the bug? Annihilate the bug? What word is better? Annihilate or eviscerate? Like, all this shit. Like, this, this is pointless. This is a pointless fucking 
thing to do. That that's that's my idea on it. So this was a lot to go back and over with um, enjambments, which is just going down to the next line, guys. Like, what do you think about this? What do you do? And um, one of the questions that, and maybe I'll save it for um, another time, but talk about justification, like left justified, center justified, right justified. I'll save that for another day because this is kind of a, a lot here. And I still want to get into this next little topic. All right. So this next topic we're going to talk about here is another email I got. This is actually not the question that I thought it was. I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll read this like this. This is someone referring to the spreadsheet video I did that I think is an Anarchy Crew video. Maybe it's not. I don't remember. But they said... Watching your spreadsheet vid, I like that it keeps track of how full a book gets so you know easily when it's ready to put out, but I have absolutely no desire to play the submission game. I don't fit into boxes and do not get chosen for stuff like that. I'm the option that intrigues a judge, but they pass on for someone who fits the rubrics better. Um, I hate the idea of giving the ownership of my poem to something so unlikely to be thrown into slush piles and read by undergrad interns. <laughs> I don't want to write poems and have them be dead for three months to a year because I'm waiting on someone else's approval to throw it in the back of a magazine so it could be read by 5% of its readership. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> um, I usually have more success when I make my own boxes. I'm not a pick me kind of person. Might be my ego there. It's degrading. <laughs> my energy is precious. It seems like too much energy for so little promise of return. My spirit just doesn't want to do it, but I feel about most things that involve someone else's rules. I realize this does not always correlate with whether something that may be beneficial to me. Do you think I'm just bucking because it's my nature, therefore shooting myself in the foot by not playing the game? Is it worth it? Has it been worth it to you? And the answer is no. It's not fucking worth it to me. A couple things right off the bat I could relate to, and then some of these things, like, glow. Okay? So, like, for instance, it's like, I don't fit into boxes and usually don't get chosen for stuff like that. I might be, I might intrigue a judge, but at the end of the day, I'm not going to get picked. That statement, it, it's hard because I don't know if that is something that can be quantifiable because every judge is going to be different. Every judge is going to want to pick their own things for their own certain reasons or editors or anything like that. So that one... I feel that a lot of times, but I think a lot of that is just me kind of getting in my own way. This next one, though, hating giving the idea of ownership of my poem to someone to be thrown into a slush pile and read by undergrad interns. That's fucking hysterical. But then the whole thing with, like, I didn't write poems to have them be dead for three months to a year because I'm waiting on someone else's approval. And then, like, if you would have left that there, that would have been, like, yeah, totally. And then you keep going. Someone else's approval to throw it in the back of a magazine so it could be read by 5% of its readership. Oh. Damn! Shots fired. Man down. Man down. Oh, my God. That is so fucking good. Ooh, that is like... Oh, if that wasn't so wordy, I would want that on a fucking t-shirt. I'm not even fucking joking. But that's the thing that drives me crazy. Like, if you guys remember... I can't remember if it was the New Yorker. I can't remember what thing it was. I sent them some poems, and it took them 15 months. It took 15 months to get a rejection. Okay? That's fucking crazy. And the joke's on them. I put the put those in other magazines or other things since then because I forgot I sent them to him because it took him so long to get back to me. So with that being said, my spreadsheet failed because I ended up putting them elsewhere anyway. But yeah, no, like it, it doesn't work. And like when I was doing the talk with Matthew Buckley Smith, I can't remember if it was on my show or his show, but we were talking about how when I make my chapbooks, my chapbooks probably 
have more people reading them, like, and reading them intently than people who would read me even if I got into a bigger magazine. Like, as you say, 5% of its readership. Exactly. You know, not everyone reads every fucking poem in every fucking magazine. And that's kind of why I like the blood rags so much. Because it's like, this is one piece of paper, fucker. There's going to be as many poems on here as I can fit. And you're going to fucking read all of them. Because it's really not that taxing. Deal. You know what I'm saying? So, the big thing about the blood rag that I could say is that I'm pretty sure that any poem that gets into the blood rag is going to be read by probably 90 to 95% of its readership. And that's, that's a pretty big fucking deal. But this is why I am so constantly urging people to start their own zines, start their own presses, start their own websites. I, I, websites are fine. I just think nobody reads websites like they do. Like when you get your poem published on a website, to me, it feels more throwaway. It feels more throwaway than if you were to actually print that poem out and put it on windshields of cars. Okay? Like, yes, you need to do this allegedly so you have cred for your fucking bio that when you send out to bigger places. But at the end of the day, if you don't care about that shit and you're not going to be doing that fucking thing, start your own thing. Like, start your own zine. You know, do it. And because the other thing, too, is when people wait around for magazines to even get back to you, that's fucking soul crushing, dude. Or you get to the point where you don't even realize that you've sent stuff out and you forget. So when you do get an acceptance or a rejection, you're like, oh, I forgot I even did that. If you ever get to the point that your work, you can't remember what you fucking did with it, that's, you did something wrong. You fucked up. You know what I'm saying? So, like, I think everyone who has taste, and that could be taken in a, a lot of different ways, but if you have, like, when you read poetry, and you go, I like this kind of poem, not so much this kind of poem, and I like this kind of poem, and not so much this kind of poem. Right there, you have a taste that not everyone has. So make, you're an editor now. Put something out, okay? And funnel in the stuff you like so you can start promoting that to other people. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm a huge proponent of that and maybe it just comes from when i was a kid like everyone was making zines about stuff they were into whether it was mainly music but there was a lot of other shit too like skateboarding and skateboarding <laughs> skateboarding bands shows there was movie ones too movies and tv shows but just shit people were into you know if you have like a flavor you know, that you can share with people, fucking do it. Um, there was one more question that I thought was this one, but I just realized it was on a different platform. So here is the deal. This was about my um, rarity versus scarcity bit. Your ideas about rarity seem to me to be an unintentional way of creating an elite group that gets to have my poetry. I want everyone in the world to have my poetry if they want it. I don't feel comfortable with marketing strategies that play off of people's insecurity about being in the in crowd. It feels manipulative, though I'm not sure you don't intend it to be that way. Why can't people just buy my book because they love it? Regardless of what anyone thinks about it. Um... I like the idea of creating limited editions, but the original, it should be available to anyone. And so I wanted to kind of hit this because, and what I said to her when she sent this to me, I'm like, shit, if you think this, then a lot of people probably think this. So I just want to make this clear. Well, the first thing I'm going to say about it is how I put stuff out for me 
is definitely different than how I'm wanting to do Poetic Anarchy Press. Poetic Anarchy Press has a completely different, like, book launch marketing strategy than I do for my own stuff. Will some of my stuff fall into that? It might, but what I do for me is not going to be what Poetic Anarchy Press does. And I'll explain that a little bit here too. Basically, an unintentional way of creating an elite group that gets to have my poetry or your poetry or whatever. So here's the deal. Again, this goes back to like the whole punk rock, like collecting vinyl and different editions would be different things. Okay. And as you recall in that, um, or you might recall, in that talk, I was talking about the um, pink vinyl edition of Legacy of Brutality by the Misfits. It was only only 16 were made on pink vinyl. Okay. Now, the other side of that is, is that only 16 were made pink vinyl, but like 100 were made on white vinyl and like 1,000 were made on black vinyl. Okay. So the people who were like your true fans, the people who fucking give a shit, the people who interact with you, send you emails, are a part of your mailing list, the whole thing, those people, because they are giving you so much of themselves and their just fandom of you, you should give them extra shit. You should give them stuff as like a thank you kind of thing. So when you are making rare kind of things for them like keep them in mind when you do that now if the pricing thing makes that feel dirty and feel weird then maybe that's not something you should do but i just get a little bent out of shape when i'm selling something for a certain amount of money and then as soon as i'm out of those things people are selling them online for fucking way more than i'm fucking making you know and like there's a part of me that's like, fuck, I would like to not struggle as hard as I am, you know? But again, that just goes back to collectability. And I don't think that's making an elite anything. Because, like I was saying to her, was fingering the mundane, the paperback. That is a bunch of out-of-print chapbooks. All my chapbooks that go out of print, like, I'm eventually going to put out in a paperback that everyone can have. And when I do that, those editions are going to be put out forever. You know what I'm saying? Like, Fingering the Mundane, the first print run was only 50 copies. But you could get it now, and it's the second edition. And once Poetic Anarchy Press is up and going, I'm going to have a third edition of that that is going to have a different trim size that um, is more accessible to everybody. And when Poetic Anarchy Press is going, you always want to make more runs of your books. That means your books are successful, you know? So keep fucking making the books if the books are selling out. You know what I'm saying? End of everything, same thing. There is going to come a time very soon here where I'm going to have to put in another order to, um, and I guess I'll just wait till Poetic Anarchy Press starts up, to um, print out the new copies of the end of everything the new edition of that and when i say edition i just mean like another print run and because i'm as anal as i am i will probably change little things in each print run or at least like number the print runs so people know what print run they're looking at and they own or whatever because again like collectability is like a big thing for me and like being someone who collected comic books and collected magazines and collected albums and all this other shit, you always want the lowest number. So, like, if I have... Like, right now, I have a copy of... Oh, what's the name of that book? The first fucking Mike Hammer book, uh, Mickey Spillane. I, the Jury, I think is what it's called. I have a copy of that book that costs a pretty decent amount, and it's a super old paperback of it. And it's the 64th printing. And I was like, Jesus fucking Christ. Like, but it, it, it was only like a year or two after the book had come out. That's how successful that book was. 
me getting a book from 1950 that was the 64th printing of I, the Jury is cool, but at the same time, if I came across a 30th printing of I, the Jury, I'm going to pick that up if I could afford it. You know what I'm saying? That's just me being a nerdy collector. Another example of that, just with these pocket poet books from City Lights. Like you have like Howl right here. Let me see if it says in here what the print run on this guy is. It does not say, but like this was the original copyright on this is 1956. So this does not say, do any of these say, I wonder. 1964. Okay, well, a good way to find this out is if you look at the back of this book, the price for it is eight ninety five. Okay, if you look at this one Kenneth Patchen Pocket Poets book, oh, and they did it here, fifth printing. Okay, so this is the fifth printing of this book, seventy five cents. Okay, stapled spine. This is fucking brilliant. I fucking love this. So this is the fifth printing of this, and it is. Fifth printing, 1959. Yeah, they used to say it, and they stopped, I guess, when they started having to do it, like, a million fucking times. I will want to always put in what printing everything is. And I don't think I'm trying to create an elite group. I'm trying to just give something to the people who really appreciate the work that I make. Something extra, something special, you know? I don't think it makes an in-crowd because I don't think, like, the people who get the book, like, if I have a book that has ten copies of it, I don't think those ten people are, like, getting together in the Zoom calls and, like, chatting up how awesome they are that they got these ten books and nobody else did. I don't think any of the people even talk to each other. And when I talked about, like, once my books... Like, once the chat books sell out, I intend on putting them into collections that seem to settle the question about what the fuck I'm doing. So, I don't know. Does that sit better with you guys? Like, did you guys, were you unaware of that? Like, did I not make that clear? The scarcity and rarity thing is real, but once I make, like, a paperback version of that, of those books that are out of print, that is something that will always be made over and over again. And I will be putting print runs in those books to let everybody know that there's a, still a bit of a collectability thing there. But that's just me being a nerd collector guy. So what do you guys think? Let me know down below. And now I'm going to plug yo butts with your mom. <laughs> So on with the butt plugs. There's only one thing that's important right now, guys, and that is your mom. Your mom needs you. Your mom needs your help. Your mom is reaching out your mom's hand, wanting you to grab it, wanting you to pull it towards your self, your center. Pull your mom towards your center, okay? So over on Indiegogo. I think the actual website is igg.me slash at slash your mom. Spelt Y E R M O M, your mom. Okay. That is where you have to go to get winner of your mom's sodomy prize for poetry. Okay. And I did a live stream earlier today where we were talking about why the book is called what it's called and everything like that. And apparently it wasn't abundantly clear from the title. And so when I explained it, some people were like, oh, that's actually kind of cool. So if you weren't aware of that, go to my YouTube page and look for your mom's launch party if you want to hear that story. But yeah, check that out. And another thing that came up in the live stream was somebody asked if I do private workshops, like private classes with people. And I totally do. So if you want to do a private um, poetry class with me where I just go over your shit with you and we talk about it and I give you assignments and shit like that, hit me up. I hate Matt Wall at gmail.com. We'll go from there. And if you want to put any of your work in the blood rag, you can send it to a new email address. Okay. I'm trying to keep all Poetic Anarchy Press stuff with Poetic Anarchy Press and not with my stuff. So if you want to submit to the blood rag, 
a poem, 16 lines or less. You can send as many poems as you want if you have a bunch. Send it to poeticanarchypress at gmail.com, subject line, blood rag submissions. Okay? And that's all you got to do. So, with all of that said, we have two backers right now, and I want to thank Caitlin and JH for backing the project so far. Um, and if you, oh, here's another thing too. If you want the photo, the 8x10 photo of me on the can and me writing a letter to your mom, those are add ons. So once you pick whatever tier you want, when you check out, it'll ask you if you want to add those things on to whatever you're already getting. Okay. So that's how you figure that shit out. So I think that's pretty much done. So with that said, everybody, type hard, do your mom right, and I will talk to you all later. I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Crew and my followers on Patreon. I appreciate the hell out of you guys. And thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew or the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.